Our final keynote event is a discussion of interagency challenges with Mr. David Rothkop. Mr. Rothkop is a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, as well as the former CEO and editor-in-chief of the Foreign Policy Group. As a writer, Mr. Rothkop is the author of more than 1,000 articles on international themes for publications that, in addition to foreign policy, include the New York Times, the Washington Post, Financial Times, and Foreign Affairs. His book, National Insecurity, American Leadership in an Age of Fear, is his second major history of foreign policy and national security decision making in the US government. Other recent books include Power Inc., The Epic Rivalry Between Biz Big Business and a Government and the Reckoning That Lies Ahead, Superclass, The Global Power Elite and the World They Are Making, and Running the World, the Inside Story of the National Security Council and the Architects of American Power. His most recent book is entitled The Great Questions of Tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. David Rothkopf. Good morning. Um, I've been asked to be provocative. It's going to be tough for me. Uh, it's not in my nature, um, but I'm going to give it a shot. Because um, I think, by and large, you've probably been talking about all the wrong things. Um, and uh, I have 45 minutes, and, and, and maybe I can make up for that. Uh, I, I think right now, whether you're talking about civilian military relations or you're talking about national security uh, or you're talking about foreign policy, we've got a kind of a crisis crisis. Um, and, and that is that we're, we're looking at the wrong crisis. Now, this is a fairly common occurrence for most of us. For most of us, we've spent the past 18 years looking at national security through the lens of terrorism, which was the wrong crisis. It was the wolf closest to the sled. It was an important thing to address, but it was not the big coming destabilizing massive change that we needed to focus on. And so we've spent a lot of time focusing on the wrong things. And now when you have a discussion, and you're, whether it's again talking about civil mill relations or it's talking about national security or it's talking about politics or it's talking about foreign policy, we're having a, a different kind of crisis crisis because you can't help but get caught up in the political crisis of the moment which is not an insubstantial thing and again I'm, I'm here to be provocative so I'm just gonna lay it on the table the way I see it and then move on from that because I, I as, as fascinating as it is to spend all day long talking Trump 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 um, and it's crazy and what's going on in Washington is absolutely nuts, it's not going to go on forever. Um, it, it's going to cause some damage. It's going to cause some lasting damage. But Donald Trump's going to be gone. Soon, probably. I, I think sooner than 2020, if you have to ask my bet. But, but he may be gone in 2024. He's, he's going to be gone sometime soon. John Bolton is a terrible choice as national security advisor. I've written two histories of the National Security Council, and we're going to get to some questions. I'd be very happy to answer your questions about that. But he's the worst choice I've ever seen for National Security Council, and I actually remember Mike Flynn. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, you know that's, it's terrible. But I don't think John Bolton is going to last as long as Donald Trump lasts. You know, somehow he's managed to pull a guy down, for, you know, off the shelf who's we already know is involved with Cambridge Analytica and the Russian government and a whole bunch of other crazy nonsense, on top of the fact that he is himself unhinged, on top of the fact that he is a self-promoter who's going to compete with his boss for airtime, which is absolutely the worst thing you can do for a president who actually does not believe the world exists outside of Fox and Friends. You know, that's like, he, we're in an airplane, we're all passengers in the airplane, and the pilot has an instrument panel with one instrument on it, which is a TV screen, which is Fox and Friends. 
and he's flying the plane based on what he sees in that screen. The reaction he wants to get out of it, you know, that's all the information he's getting out of it. He doesn't read other stuff. That's it. Okay, that's crazy. Okay, and I'm very happy to talk about that if you guys haven't had enough of that in your life. But I don't think that that's the, the, the real underlying issue for the crisis that we've got in civ mill relations, um, or the crisis, frankly, that anybody has who's involved in the business of national security, whether it's here at West Point or it's in the United States government. Um, and, and, and I'm going to give you sort of 10 variables recognizing that you're all leaving at 11 o'clock. So I'm going to stop talking before then because that would hurt my feelings if you all got up and left. So I'm going to talk for 15 or 20 minutes and then we'll have some questions and answers. But, but I, I want to talk about what I think are driving the current crisis. And I'm going to do it in shorthand and then rely on you to sort of tease out, um, tease out the elements of it. Um, and I'm going to start with something that's related to the current political crisis. Um, and that's what I would call irrational exuberance. You remember the term irrational exuberance? This was, you know, uh, Alan Greenspan came up with it to talk about the market before the market blew up. And right now we've got this kind of, you know, defense budget, Department of Defense, you know, na you know, U.S. military irrational exuberance going on. Nobody can say a bad word. You know, we, we, we treat the military like they're religious figures. Um, you know, the, the defense, you know, the, the argument the President of the United States makes for the defense budget is it's the biggest ever. And, you know, there doesn't have to be a substantiation or an explanation of why it's the biggest ever. Uh, he wants to stand near people who are in the military because he sees that as elevating. He surrounds himself with generals. That's going to backfire, of course, because as, you know, the generals start telling him things he doesn't want to hear. He's going to start distancing himself, and that'll be complicated. But, but there is this whole kind of thing that we've lived through, frankly, for a couple of decades, where we don't ask enough questions about, are we setting the right priorities? Why are we not being successful in the ways that we want to be successful? The kind of scrutiny that we need to have, because, frankly, the record's been pretty mixed. Uh, and, frankly, what we're spending is too much and we're spending it on the wrong things. And, you know, I have a feeling, and again, I'm doing this in shorthand and I'm happy to tease it out, but I have a feeling that we're sort of right around the Battle of Lepanto, um, where we're, you know, we've got battleships and we've, mm -hmm. you know, they're all in port and we're ready for the next big naval war. Well, you know, you can use Pearl Harbor, which was shortly after that. Um, and you know, it's, it's, we're ready for the wrong conflict with the wrong tools and the wrong mindset and the wrong strategies, and we could really use some intense scrutiny about what our priorities are and why we're not having these discussions and so forth. And I think that this, you know, gets me sort of the second point, which is I, I think it's probably better for saints that they end up having to die before being made saints, you know, so they have to sort of live life within normal constraints. And I think when you elevate, you know, people up and you create reverence instead of the right kind of scrutiny, you, you end up with, with, with problems and, and, and that's someplace we've gotten. But I think too much money is another problem in this regard. If you go and say, well, here's a blank check, you can get everything you want, what do you do? Well, a lot of people have entrenched interests in legacy systems. So they just buy some more of those legacy systems because that's kind of how they get paid. That's how they get evaluated. And, you know, you've heard all of these discussions before, you know, you can't be the top guy in the Air Force unless you fly planes and you can't be the top guy in the Navy unless you're leading a carrier battle group or doing something like that. And those are the wrong incentives because those aren't, the kind of conflicts that we're going to be facing. And having too much money essentially forces people, uh, it doesn't force people to make choices or to make the right kind of evaluations. And we're not doing that. We're, and, 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 you know, let's think about our history of the recent past. It's not that we've been 
flummoxed by the richest adversaries. We're facing the poorest adversaries, and they're flummoxing us because they're actually being forced to creatively come up with ways to use the limited resources they have. And you know, when we're someplace else. And so I think those are issues. Now I think another issue that you know, is complicating this problem, and I'm building to the ones that I think are bigger complications, is a broken palm mill nexus, right? And where the palm mill nexus occurs in a couple of places. One is in the chain of command, right up at the top of the chain of command. And at the top of the chain of command, you've got um, an incompetent, unhinged guy who doesn't like to read and doesn't really care to know what's going on. And, you know, that's not good. It's, it's, it's a flaw in the chain of command if the guy in the top of the chain of command is incompetent to the job, right? Um, you've also got a National Security Council, which was built after, you know, the Second World War by a bunch of people who saw a president, Franklin Roosevelt, who didn't want his right hand to know what his left hand was doing. And they said, we can't fight the next war that way. We need an apparatus to actually bring choices together for the president and so forth. And um, that was, you know, a reasonable thing. That's not what's happening. Because A, the president doesn't take advice, and B, he doesn't read stuff. And now C, the White House is surrounded in chaos, and, and D, the guy who's supposed to be running this process doesn't pl play well with others. Um, and is not going to be seen as the honest broker in the kind of Brent Scowcroft uh, model, which is the, the, the gold standard for this kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, the agencies have been, in the case of State Department, gutted. In the case of other agencies, there are other issues at play. So the National Security Council is as dysfunctional as the National Security Council has ever been, and that causes a problem because that's the nexus between the civilian part of the government and the military part of the government outside of the chain of command. And so that's, that's another issue, and we can, we can talk about that. But I think there's something even more disturbing getting into the bigger issues that are associated with this, and that is that the move towards uh, John Bolton and the move towards Mike Pompeo uh, and the move away from some of the axis of adults, although that didn't really manifest itself, um, uh, is, is, a, is a problem for a bigger reason. And, and, and it's not because they're a war cabinet, and it's not because they're going to make a war with North Korea more likely, or a war with Iran more likely, although they will. Um, the, the real reason is that they have essentially coalesced, not because there is a Trump doctrine, because I guarantee you there's no Trump doctrine. He has no geopolitical view at all. He views sort of, you know, foreign policy the same way he views the suit he puts on in the morning. It's kind of like, how does this make me look? Um, and, you know, I think that's probably not the right way to view foreign policy. But, um, but, but because of his in inclinations and John Bolton's inclinations and Mike Pompeo's inclinations and the passivity of the Republican Congress and a whole bunch of other things, we're about to take a hard turn away from 75 years of American foreign policy. Because 75 years of American foreign policy have been built on the idea, again, that was born after the Second World War, of establishing international institutions, of using those international institutions uh, in the, it, to help uh, avoid conflict, of establishing alliances, of recognizing that we're in alliances not because we're given something to somebody else, but because we're getting something out of it, of respect for international law, um, which is you know something that John Bolton has specifically, explicitly said we ought not to respect. Um, and and look at it. It's not, I'm not just sort of pulling stuff out of thin air. We got out of the Paris Accord. We got out of TPP. We're renegotiating NAFTA. We undercut our alliances, we've said bad things about NATO, we've um, uh, uh, you know, spoken, uh, 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 you know, sort of ill of the concept, underlying concept of alliances, um, we gutted the State Department and so forth. This is the most nationalist shift in U.S. foreign policy since the 20s, you know, and, 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 it, and it's really dangerous because 
the international system was predicated on the most powerful country in the world leading it and being invested in it, putting its capital into it, and we are now moving away from that. Uh, and so that's, that's, a, that's a very dangerous um, development, and I think we, we owe that in part to the breakdown at this nexus point. Um, I think to get a little bit deeper into the, the, the nature of the problem, in civ mill relations is that, is, is that we're talking about the wrong civilians. Um, uh, you know, we, we, there, there's a lot of civilians out there, and of course we want, everybody wants to have generally good relations. But the people who understand what the future nature of conflict is are not as involved in this conversation as they need to be. The people who are going to provide the decisive edge in the nature of the future, nature of conflict, are not as engaged in this conversation as they need to be. Um, and in fact, the, 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 you know, some of the civilians upon whom the process has historically relied, like people in think tanks, are disconnected. I did when, when I was doing one of those books, I looked at think, the top 10 think tanks for the past 10 years. And I ranked all the things they studied, all the papers and all the events and so forth. And dead last, you know, under conferences about Pakistan and under conferences, you know, dead last was science and technology. We don't have the people who actually understand what's going to drive the future of conflict in the room. Now, it used to be in the 1950s, if you wanted to be a national security person, you had to learn how to talk nuclear. You had to be able to say, what's a throw weight or whatever. You, know, you wouldn't be taken seriously in the conversation. But you know, I, I, I talked to General uh, Mike Hayden at one point uh, about, about you know, time in his tenure. And he said he would go to the White House and brief them on cyber. And he said he felt like Rain Man. You know, that, that no, you know, people didn't understand anything that he was saying. And, and, and this, is a, this is a reality. If I were to say to you, any of you who are experts, um, how many people at the policy level in the US government, and I kind of always loved that about the US government, that the policy level was this thing, and then the working level was something else. And only in Washington is working level an insult. Right? But it, you know, how many people at the policy level in the United States government can have a conversation about AI, about the next stage of AI, or big data, or cyber defense, or cyber offense. How, you know, would they fill this room? Would they fill this corner of the room? Would they fill these four chairs? I mean, it's, you know, you go to the Congress, you, they're, they're not there. So we've got a problem, which is that the civilians who are normally involved in this process are not trained. Now, I leave it to you to discuss whether the military leadership who is involved in this process is trained to have that conversation. Um, my friend Tom Ricks has written and talked about the fact, and I think it was a project he was doing with Rosa, about um, how at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the military, US Military Academy was established here and said, we have to train engineers because that's where the world is going. Well, the world is going someplace else. And you, know, you talk about civilian military relations, you talk about what the challenges we face. If we don't have people who are actually trained to understand the challenges, frame the challenges, solve the challenges, rise the challenges, we got a problem. And, you know, at the same time, we have a, a kind of strategic, we're at a strategic watershed, but it's already being misunderstood. We spent 17 years going, oh, we're fighting terrorists. Um, and that's the, that's the big thing we've got to go and fight. And finally, in the past 12 months, it's become in vogue again to say, no, it's, it's great powers. It was always great powers, but it's in vogue again. We can admit that it's great powers. Well, that's good. That's a relief because that's the right thing to discuss. What's, what's bad is that we've immediately fallen into old Cold War habits. So it's like, 
you know, okay, great powers, it's zero sum, you know, because in the Cold War, if Soviets lost something, we gained something. But the rising great power in the world is not the Russians, it's the Chinese. And we are interdependent with the Chinese. And if we hurt the Chinese, we hurt ourselves. And the Chinese don't have the same kind of ambitions that the Russians did. And are they a potential rival? Yes. Are they a potential threat in the way that the Russians were or are? No. And do we need a doctrine of interdependence? Yes, we do. We need something that is different. But I've been reading articles in places like Foreign Affairs by very serious people who you know, are saying, well, we got this wrong. You know, we thought if the Chinese just liberalized a little bit, they'd become just like us. And they didn't. Well, no, we didn't. Nobody thought that. Um, it makes for an interesting premise for an article. It's just wrong. Um, you know, they, you know, I mean, Henry Kissinger used to say, I worked with him for a while, and Henry Kissinger used to say that the big, one of the biggest misconceptions of Americans is that anybody anywhere else, given the chance, would want to become just like America. Um, well, it's not true. The but, but the Chinese are going to have a lot more influence on a lot of things that are really super important in this debate. And if our immediate response to the strategic watershed is to say, no, we cut them off, they're our rivals, they're our enemies, we're, you know, we can't communicate with them, we're going to have a problem. Because they're going to lead the way on AI in the same way that they led the way on solar. And we thought, well, we invented the internet. We're going to set the rules for the internet. Guess what? We're not setting the rules for the internet. You know, we said the internet's going to be a free global commons. And the Chinese said, well, no, it's actually a sovereign domain, and we're going to control the sovereign domain the way we want to. And we thought, well, we'll win that argument. And guess what? We're not. And we're not just losing it with, you know, the bad guys. There are a lot of countries in the world, that, you know, from Singapore to India to Saudi Arabia to Brazil, who have said, nah, maybe we're a little more in their camp than we are in your camp. So if we get into this kind of Cold War mindset, zero-sum mindset with this rising power that is increasingly decided that it does have a role. I mean, you know, you talk about big changes. Yeah, Donald Trump's a big change. Xi Jinping deciding that China ought to be out there is a reversal of 500 years of Chinese history since they had eunuch admirals fly, you know, going out into the world you know, in the middle of the Ming Dynasty. They've finally said, no, we're, our place is out there. Our place is to lead. And if you think about it, think about the beginning of the Obama administration. In the middle of the financial crisis, everybody was going, no, there's going to be a G2. The G2. And the Chinese were like, no, no, we don't want to be part of the G2. Now they're like, yeah, if you're not going to lead, we'll be the G1. Uh, so we, we need to reckon this, and we need new sets of policies, and part of the problem is that not only do we not have the right people in the right places discussing the big technological changes, we don't have the right discussion going on on the big geopolitical changes, and to get strategy right, you've got to get worldview right, and we're not getting worldview right, and in part that's because the policy ecosystem doesn't work. Um, you know, think tanks don't work. Think tanks, I call think tank, and by the way, I've been involved with the Carnegie Endowment for 20 years. Um, but uh, think tanks are, are kind of giant meat lockers where we store government officials until we need them again. Uh, and if that's the case, what happens in the think tank is that people don't take risks because they know that everything is on the internet and everything is going to be used in a confirmation hearing. And so people don't, you know, talk about, this is a different kind of confirmation bias, people don't take big chances to come up with things that might be offensive. So the think tanks are the least likely places to do this, and we know they're not talking about science and tech. And frankly, there's a generational issue. And the current book that I'm working on is about how the baby boomers sort of let down the world. The greatest generation came in, and they said, it came to the end of World War II, and they said, we need to hand our children a better world. And, they, and the few years after World War II was this unbelievable flowering of in creativity in terms of policy. We created NATO. We created the World Bank. We created the IMF. We created the international system. We laid the foundation for the WTO. We laid the foundation for the European community, for NATO, et cetera, et cetera, with the NSC the uh, Department of Defense, the CIA, China, 
Israel, India, all these things came about in a like, couple of year period because we didn't want to go back and go through what we had gone through in terms of the worst conflict the world had ever known. And for years, those things kind of worked. And then we handed off to four, four baby boomers in a row now, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump, three of whom, by the way, if you want to bring this up at a cocktail party, were born in 1946. Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump were all born in 1946. And they were kind of complacent. And we didn't invest anything in those new institutions. We didn't invest anything in revitalizing our alliances or repurposing our alliances or coming up with the next generation institutions that deal with transnational threats in an effective way. We didn't invest in that infrastructure. Um, and it, the time for the baby boomers is up. If we have got to move on to a new generation. It's happening, by the way. You know, um, uh, Macron and Trudeau were both born in 1979. They are technically millennials, right? They just they be, they came of age in this century. They turned 21 in this century. The prime minister of New Zealand is a year younger than them, and of course Kim Jong Un and MBS in Saudi Arabia are much younger than them. And so there is a new generation coming up. But the question is, where are those people in this conversation? And that's one of the reasons I think the think tank conversation is broken. Is, you know, it's not just it's too inside the beltway, but it's also the wrong people. You know, they're, they're not the stakeholders in this change. And I think that's a, a, a problem. Um, and so what we end up with is we, do, we don't even know what the right questions are, you know. We, do, we, we don't know what a war is. We don't know what peace is. We know that it's changed. We will sit here and we'll talk about, you know, the modern war institute. But we've entered this era of what I call cool war, which is, you know, something completely different because it used to be during the Cold War that the price of conflict was so high that no one dared actually have a conflict. Um, but now we've entered a period in which the price of conflict is so low that no one dares not fight all the time. Now, does that make the world safer or less safe? If we are constantly at each other, just below the surface, in ways that are hard to detect, in ways that we don't know how to deter, is that a safer world or a less safe world? Um, and how does that affect civ-mill relations? You know, think, of, think about this. You know, if you go and you fight a, 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 a war of the traditional side, one of the big drivers of civil mill relations is, do we want our young people to go off and, and die in this war? But in the new world that we're entering, first world powers will be fighting over the horizon with swarms of intelligent, um, drones and, and, and with cyber and with other tools where the kids are not at risk. But civilians will be at risk all the time. They, they may see their bank accounts being reduced. They may, they may see the lights going off. They may see, you know, there are all sorts of other kinds of things. And so as we enter a new period with a new kind of conflict, we have to ask new kinds of questions about what is going to drive those relations? And we might say, well, it's not going to happen for a while. But it's happening now. It's happening now. I mean, you know, the, the, the 2016 elections were just a prelude. You know, there were some bots. There were some guys in St. Petersburg. They were coming up with, you know, some nasty little sort of badly translated attacks. And they were trying to inflame us all. But what about when there are fleets, I don't know, I'm not sure what the right noun is there, but of, of AI-driven bots, smart bots? What about when do you enter the point in a p political discourse where you, you don't know, you know, that we, we fail the Turing test for our political discourse and where we don't know how much of the conversation is between humans and how much of the conversation is between algorithms? You know, and, 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 and 
There's no borders to that. We can say anything we want about foreign interference in elections. It's almost impossible to stop it. And, you know, I can come up with, you know, question after question. But, you know, you know some of the fundamental ones, like what, what if algorithms are power? You know, I, I, I could make a case that the most powerful person in the world is not the president of the United States. The most powerful person in the world is the person who writes the algorithm that says what story comes up first in your Facebook feed. Because that person is going to determine what your worldview is to a greater extent, or the, the person who writes that algorithm or is in charge of that algorithm, than anybody else. And, you know, that's not a discussion that we have, you know, there's, there's not a big discussion going on about that stuff. We're talking about Stormy Daniels and we're talking about Trump's hair, and we're talking about Bolton and, you know, whatever, you know, frothing at the mouth thing he's doing at the moment. But we're not, you know, we're not 30, 40, 50 years away from a massive sea change. We're in the midst of it. And there is no expert on artificial intelligence who doesn't think that it's going to be deployed and working in 60 years. Some think it's 50, 40, 30, 20. But, but there's nobody who says never. You know, there's nobody who doesn't recognize the demographic changes that are taking place in the world. I mean, you know, you talk about, you know, some of the questions that come out of this. One of the questions that comes out of it is you change the nature of war, you change the nature of the skills needed, you change the nature of whether you need, you know, the gender biases and the age biases that we've had in the past, because maybe it's better to have, you know, people who are, you know, smarter and adept and, you know, certain kinds of things in computers, because that's really the, the, the pointy edge of the spear in this kind of conflict. Um, and, and, and all of these questions require a different kind of understanding of what, you know, civ mill relations are, I think. Um, and they require different sieves and they require different mills. And I guess that's where the, 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 the problem is, is, is summarized, really, is that we got a people problem to go with our crisis crisis. Um, and so I'm all for discussing the politics, and we've got 10 minutes here, and I'm happy to discuss it. We got, I'm all for discussing the process. Um, Political scientists love to discuss process. I'm not a political scientist. I'm from New Jersey. I'm like, you know, I, I just sort of write about stuff as I see it. But, but, and, and I've been in the government and sort of lived it. But it, I, I think we need to stop and say, are we asking the right questions? Are we at a watershed that requires big, big strategic rethinking? Because I think that this, that is the area, if there was one area that I would criticize, I think we're failing at it. And just as I throw, throw away as a last point, I've taught at Columbia for the past 20 years. I teach at Johns Hopkins at the moment. I've sort of gone around and seen it. I go into the top 20 schools of public affairs and international affairs in, in the United States. Um, somebody was talking about civics education earlier. Uh, Three of those top 20 schools require that, some, that students take a course in ethics. Um, and a lot of the questions we're talking about have profound ethical consequences. None of them require that they take courses in science and technology. That we are training the next generation of leaders in the wrong way, on the wrong things. Uh, and that's a fatal flaw. And we, we, can, we can have all sorts of conversations about moving the deck chairs around on that Titanic. But I, I think these, these bigger questions require some answers. So we got 10 minutes before people head for a bus. Yes, sir. Uh, Major Mac, I'm with MWI. First, you're a baby boomer. Why should we listen to everything you said? <laughs> it's a good question, and one my daughters ask regularly. Yeah. Uh, but you gave the techno-optimist case. I mean, really, it, it, the, and there's, there's room for skepticism. You remember the phrase, I think Peter Thiel, his comment, uh, they promised us flying cars, we got 140 characters. So I have, to, I have to say, by the way, 
you attack me for being a baby boomer, and then you quote Peter Thiel. So I think we're even here. I would, I would, I, I, I'm 79 too, and I, we're definitely not millennials. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so what, what technology do you see as truly changing the world or war, one of the two, and then uh, how long until we see it come? I think everybody's talking about AI right now, but that's kind of a very broad. Well, first of all, I think, again, I'm not a techno-optimist. I'm a techno-realist. Um, you know, I, I just see massive technological change happening all the time. And I wouldn't say that there is a techno. Will AI change the way we do things? Sure. Do, do, you know, did precision change the way weaponry worked? Yes. Is more precision or more autonomy on the part of weaponry going to change the nature of conflict a lot? Sure. What's going to drive the autonomy? Increasingly smart technologies. And so, will autonomy be it? I mean, do you want to characterize it as AI or autonomy? I don't know. What about big data? You know, the ability to store massive amounts of data. What is that going to do? Well, one of the things it's going to do is it's going to give us the ability to see correlations we've never seen before. And some of those correlations may help us be predictive in things. You know, for example, if you, you know, identify a whole bunch of people, people who uh, are close to the leader of a country and they take a certain amount of their money out of the banks in that country and move it to another country, that could be a warning sign of something. So, you know, there's something that we can learn from that. I, the, the, the point is, there is massive sweeping technological change. And, you know, if you say, what, what, where, where is it going to affect us? Well, c cyber is affecting us right now. You know, cyber, cyber is affecting, now it's, it's, it's affecting us in, in, in ways that are hard to measure, but cyber conflict is affecting us, and, and we know what we would do if we were to go to war and how we would use it. Um, but, you know, you know, we can laugh off the attack on Sony. But the attack on Sony was a big watershed because the North Koreans were able to physically destroy things in the United States, in Los Angeles. And the President of the United States fumbled to find the word. He ended up with vandalism because he didn't want to have to acknowledge that North Korea had come and done that, because that would have required a response. And so even in that little case, what did we discover? We discovered we have a huge doctrinal gap. We don't, we don't have the doctrine to deal with what's being thrown at us right now. And, and it's that kind of sort of cascading, rolling set of changes that I think we need to deal with, rather than saying, this switch is going to change the whole game. Yes, sir. I want to bring it back to Civ Mill, but before I do, I just want to talk a little bit about your, to push back a little bit on your science and technology thing. We had Fareed Zakaria address the uh, Corps of Cadets beginning of this year, talking about the countries with the best STEM uh, programs are, uh, and don't necessarily correlate with the, the most patents. And the, the two with the most patents, based on per capita, are actually Israel and Sweden, but they're not necessarily the most you know, when we think about science and technology, but what we want to know about is, it's not just about having a bunch of engineers in the audience, you have to also be innovative and in, in thinking through about problem solving and that kind of thing. But bringing it back to that, sit Can I just say, just, and, and again, you were the one who asked me to be provocative. <laughs> um, but, but, but that's just a lot of bullshit. Um, uh, you know, the, the United States has gone for a long time saying, oh no, we're the great innovators. That's the thing that set us apart. T go and look it up. Take the top 10 inventions that you think have changed the world in the past 150 years. Eight of them were invented someplace else. We're good at perfecting new ideas and going to scale because we had the only scale economy. Guess what? We don't anymore. And there are other scale economies, and there are other people who are becoming good at that. And we are comforting ourselves by saying, oh, we have this secret sauce. But it's Chinese secret sauce that has made green energy, solar energy, solar panels affordable in, in the world today. And if you had to look back, if, if you know, historians look back in 100 or 200 years, they may say that was the decisive change in terms of security of the planet. Um, so I'm not so sure I'm comforted by, by, by Fareed. And don't listen to those baby boomers. That's another thing. <laughs> but let me just 
point it back to the interagency question because I want to ask you about the um, a little bit about how the sausage is made and wonder if there's some structural thing because you're if I read you correctly it sounds like you're making it as an HR problem if we just have the wrong people um, a McMaster HR McMaster no H like oh. human resource <laughs> but what I'm wondering about is whether or not there's something else going on in our the balance of power and without going too far down to the Goldwater Nichols and everything else but there's a theory in political science about this idea that the threat environment dictates the sieve mill and you have good sieve mill when you have actually a high external threat and a pretty low internal threat I think it's Michael Desch so I'll probably butchering this but we can imagine on the day after 9-11 that there's probably good sieve mill relations because the stakes are so high during the 90s when we're dealing with Haiti and some other peacekeeping it's probably a lot of friction because there's just maybe the stakes are low and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the ringside view in DC and how interagency sort of kicks into you know, and maybe there's greater professionalism, maybe there's a better d division of labor, when the stakes are seen as high, and maybe are we moving to that? Um, you seem to indicate a little bit that if we're moving to a Chinese um, peer, near, near peer competitor, would we then see better civil relations? I, look, I, first of all, I don't know. And I may be the wrong person to ask. I mean, I've taught foreign policy at you know, Columbia, Georgetown, and Zeiss now for the past 22 years, and I think Political science is a load of crap, and 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 you know there's a lot of you know people coming up with these great eight variable equations for things that have a hundred thousand variables. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, is 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 this, you know, is it you know th is that thesis that you just brought up is fine, except the problem with that thesis is you know that explained the civ mill relations the day after 9/11. But it didn't explain the civ mill relations a year later, and the threat environment hadn't changed. So what did change? Well, people made bad decisions, and bad decisions change it also. I've, in my writing about the NSC and that process, there are four things, there are four Ps. You know, there's process, there's people, um, there's um, politics, um, and that you know, they're, they're the priorities that they set within those kind of systems, um, and and all any it just depends, you know, it just depends on, on on what it is. You know, if you have a high functioning system with a bunch of people who work well together, you might say the process is working very well. But it's, it's in the case of the administration of George H. W. Bush, they all got along well. They had established relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. That co that colored it a lot too. Um, and the you know the political climate there, there, just, just to say that it's one thing is to, is is I think mistaken. Hey, yes, folks, sir? the shuttle actually leaves at eleven thirty, so we'll take time for one or two more questions before we close. Good. So there's no excuse to leave. Hi, uh, Phil Carter. Thank you for coming to Deep State University. Thank um, you. We are everywhere. So you know, pull out your crystal ball. Let's imagine it's twenty twenty one or twenty twenty five. President Trump has departed the stage. The 46th president has taken the oath. What are the two or three most damaged norms that are in need of immediate repair in the civil military relations realm? And how does he or she, the next president, repair those? Um, well, I think that's a good question. And I, and, I, and I think, you know, we can look at it in terms of two sort of things. You know, what are, what are damaged because of the current period, and and what is the snapback going to look like, you know, and are, what things can snap back quickly and what things are going to go slowly. But but I would say, if I were going to pick two, I would go to one that has been decaying for 40 or 50 years, and that's the international system, which has not been reinvented for this new era. The institutions have not been revitalized. We don't have institutions that deal with some critical transnational th uh, threats, um, whether it's uh, epidemics or, or climate, really. Um, but, but we also uh, uh, really need NPT 2.0, and we really need you know, NATO you know, come up with 3.1 or whatever we're going to call it. You know, we really need to revitalize those, and I, I and I and I think we we need to recognize that. And you know, frankly, and by, by the way, I'll give you know one little bit of credit here to the Trump administration. They're doing one thing right in the midst of all of this, and that's recognizing that to come up with a sensible policy in Asia, we need to revitalize the Quad. You know, when we need to refer to the region that is on that side of the world as the 
Indo-Pacific region and not the Asia-Pacific region because there's no way to counterbalance China without some relationship with India. Uh, and so, you know, going along with some of these new institutions is, is new strategic thinking. But the other thing that I would say is the top priority and the thing that really has my attention right now is how do you train leaders who are fluent in the issues that they need to be fluent in to address these things? Because I think the single most dangerous gap we face as a country is the fact that our leadership class does not have the training, the vocabulary, the capacity to understand these challenges or issues, discuss them, discuss them with other nations, sell them to the American people as is required in a democracy, to do the things that are necessary to deal with technological change, demographic change, geopolitical change, and so forth. I just don't think we're training people who are capable of that. And so those are the two areas that I would start. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, thanks for, for all of the points that you've made here today. But at TRADOC G2, we are looking at some of these issues through the Mad Scientist Initiative and also through the network engagement team. And each of those teams was probably composed of about four people, so you're right. And we just hired on one of our teams a network analyst who does linear programming and, and knows how to write logarithms. So I think the challenge I see is what you said from the beginning, that the policy is broken. The policy making is broken. So it's really difficult for us to get policy people to start supporting these, and we get a lot of pushback also from traditional military leaders who want to go back to hardware and, and all of that stuff. So we, we keep getting pushed under. So maybe from a policy level, how can we learn to, in your opinion, marry some of this to get this more um, to a higher level? Well, first of all, you need to get new cadres of people into the system. You know, I love, you know, I I'm, I'm, was in the Clinton administration, so I sort of follow some of what's going on in the Democratic Party, and, you know, you sort of see the discussions about 2020, and we have choices between 78-year-olds, 77-year-olds, 72-year-olds, uh, and say, we are, we'll, we'll sell you a new vision for America. Um, that's, you know, seems like a mistake, right? So I think we need to get some, some new blood into the system. Um, I think we have to value the parts of the United States government that actually do this. The Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House is a really important office. It's effectively empty. Um, but during the Obama administration, a friend of mine was the Under Secretary of Homeland Security for Science and Technology, and she said she read the administration's report on, on, on uh, or a, one of the reports on some next-gen threats the day it came out because they didn't even talk to her. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the community of people who deal with these issues in the United States government is small, isolated, marginalized, at the children's table, and we need to, we need to say that that has to change. I also think, by the way, that Silicon Valley and, and the biotech community have a big responsibility here, too. They have leaned away. They have not wanted to be involved. And when you reach out to them now, they send their head of government relations because what they're really afraid of is regulation. And the, the lawyers aren't going to solve anybody's problems. What you need is the engineers. You need the innovators. You need those people. And, and you sort of need to reverse mentor. And the, one of the projects I'm working on right now is how do we get the bright, young, next generation minds to kind of reverse mentor people in the policy community just to get them up to speed, just so they can have the conversation. So I think there is an education job involved in that. Is there any, anything else here before you little rush through a bus? Well, if not, thank you very much. All right, folks, before we have a uh Colonel Liam Collins, come and make the closing remarks. A couple of final admin notes for you. Uh, shuttles will leave at 11.30, same place you came in this morning. And then at Thayer, our MWI team will help you with transportation uh, to your airport or train station. On your way out, we have box lunches for you guys, so please take one of those as you go. Sir?
But it's a pleasure to close out our second annual uh, Class of 2006 War Studies Conference. Uh, I thought we had a very successful conference, but I appreciate any uh, thoughts you have of how we can improve for the next iteration. Uh, we realize, yeah, some of the panelists trying to pack five panels on, panelists in, in 90 minutes is, is too hard to get there at times. Uh, so we got that. Uh, one, one thought I had when I was out there running at 5.30 this morning doing my eight miles is maybe we should add a morning run to the uh, conference because after all, we are the military academy and that sounds like something we would do um, to set us apart from other conferences. Uh, and this, so I thought, how could I work in a quote? Because I told Max I gotta work in some kind of Hollywood quote here. Uh, so it made me think of the movie The Princess Bride, right? So when right after they're drinking the uh, poison wine, when, when the one character says, you've fallen for one of the two classic blunders, the first being never get involved in a land war in Asia, but only slightly lesser known, never go in against a, a Sicilian when clearly death is on the line. So Tony probably appreciate that one. Uh, but that's so right. But I figured this group is much too smart to fall for what is a slightly lesser known third classic blunder of never go for a run with the director of the Modern War Institute. Uh, where's Travis? Got, oh, so Travis is probably the only one that's fallen for this mistake when we were doing a staff ride uh, with, with, at, at Princeton in, uh, about five years ago in World War I staff ride in Belgium, and, and he got up in the morning to join me for a run, so he can, he can share that experience with you. Uh, but let me summarize some of the major themes from, uh, you know, probably some major kind of consensus, I guess, coming out of today or the last couple days. Uh, Huntington's still rel uh, relevant to study and read, even if he was never really had it right. Uh, and while we're still not right, really sure what civil-military relations should look like, uh, we're, we kind of can agree what it shouldn't look like. So at least we're, we're somewhere on there. Uh, if you didn't like that, Max, I got another one for you. I think Mar and others kind of captured what probably you could uh, quote captured by uh, Cool Hand Luke, which is, uh, or in the movie, uh, what we've got here is a failure to communicate. Right, so sometimes it's just communication between the parties that are involved, and maybe you don't need a, a certain model or whatever it is, but maybe it's just, hey, it starts really with communication. Uh, a third kind of major theme that, that we uh, come out of here with is uh, norms, really, they're probably more aspirational than they ever were really norms. Right, we'd like to think of them as norms and make them norms, uh, but we really haven't done the education to, to get there. So we really need to improve that education at all levels, uh, and especially in the age of social media, and really there is no, you know, the, no way to kind of separate your personal and private persona anymore, at least if you're on those kind of networks. Uh, another major uh, kind of theme emerging, right, is that the military's probably spent more time relative than our civ civilian counterparts looking at this and studying this, but that probably shouldn't come as a major surprise since, uh, you know, a lot of the civilians that come into this world, they might come from different backgrounds, professions, uh, before kind of getting into this, so you know, some brought out maybe the military needs to do a, a better job of, of educating them as we go through. Uh, so that's just some of the major points that captured. It doesn't capture all. So what I would say is we had a great discussion with the you know 70 plus of us that were over here over the last couple of days, but it would kind of be a shame or a waste if we didn't really kind of uh, capture it in a more meaningful way beyond the conference report. Uh, so I ask your help in this regard. We're going to try to do an edited uh, volume. For those that want to contribute to that, we'll keep the, uh, you, you know, the chapter length relatively short. And then as well, kind of our, our digital online platform. If you were a panelist and want to just, hey, write eight to 1,500 words on what you wrote, that's another way we can uh, get out there and kind of elevate this debate and, ke and keep the discussion going forward. Uh, and then, right, and then your own individual areas, you know, continue doing the great research that you're doing so we can, uh, you know, kind of in inform ourselves a uh, better way to do it. Uh, Last plug is, okay, we've got our call for ad adjunct scholars and non-resident fellows going out, so if you have any uh, good thoughts on who would be a good part of the uh, MWI team over the next year, uh, be, be sure to send them our ways. Uh, last, before closing out, I wanna thank our uh, audiovisual team in the back, uh, Bo, Mike, uh, Sean, and Steve for supporting us over the last couple days. Uh, I mean, we've all worked with technology, you know it'll try to fail you at the, uh, every chance it gets, so to keep it running is always a, a, t a, a task. Uh, library staff uh, for helping, you know, letting us get set up uh, in, uh, on Sunday night and, and over the last day and a half. And then for my team that's here, if you would stand up, right, they're like, you know, it's like the ducks swimming in the water. Everything, look, it just looks like it's calm, but right, they're the ones, their legs are going 100 miles an hour underneath the water. Uh, so Doreen, Scott, Jake, Jeff, Jess, Lionel, Lionel, you got to stand up too. Uh, Ryan, Nerea, and, and Rick, and half of them are probably outside trying to work shuttles and everything. 
But if you give them a round of applause, we're the ones who want to make it happen. They allow me to spend 25% of my time over to Ukraine and come back and, and not worry about a thing uh, when I get back. And it's probably better for them because then I'm not messing with them anyway and they can just make it work. Uh, then last, finally, thank all of you for coming and, and, you know, and, and investing your time to come up here and, and, and prepping those remarks and kind of uh, in your research and, and you know, an important topic. Uh, so thank you again for coming. And I guess this will officially close out our second annual Class of 2006 War Studies Conference. Thanks again for coming. Thank you.